My name is Jeremy Harper, not Josh Harper, but Jeremy Harper. Uh, and I am a speaker, trainer, and coach with the John Maxwell team. And um, I, I'd like to start off just telling a little bit about myself so that you can get to know me better. At the age of 17, my parents came to me and my younger sister and told us that we were moving to Memphis, Tennessee from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And you can just imagine how thrilled I was to hear that as a senior in high school, that I was moving in the middle of my senior year, right? No. <laughs> but um, you gotta do what you gotta do, right? You gotta go where the money is. And so uh, we moved from an all white suburb of Grand Rapids, Michigan to Memphis, Tennessee. I transferred from the McDonald's up there to a McDonald's in Memphis on Ridgeway. And I was not prepared for the difference in culture that I was about to experience. So I had a hard time understanding a lot of the people that were talking to me. So uh, the, the white people that were talking to me, some of them had such a thick Southern accent that I was having trouble understanding them. For example, my store manager somehow could take the name Chris and turn it into three syllables. Chris, come here. <laughs> I don't know how you do that, but she did it. Uh, there was an incident where I was the manager and I was walking by a black lady that was working the drive-through and she had the headset on that you take orders through and she hands me the headset and she goes, huh, Jeremy, they call me Jeremy. She said, huh, Jeremy, I gotta use it. And I was like, what? And she's like, I gotta use it. And I was like, I'm sorry, Monica, I don't know what that means. She's like, I have to use the restroom. And I was like, oh, okay, gotta use it means gotta go to the bathroom. Got it, got it, okay. Um, then we worked with, we had lots of Hispanic workers that spoke very little English. I mean, very little. And, um, and as a manager, I would get cheeseburgers brought back to me that were fixed wrong. And, and I said, man, this is a problem. I gotta figure out how to fix this, right? This, this isn't working for me. And so I said, I'm gonna go back there and I'm gonna learn their language. I'm gonna learn how to say these things in their language. So I took a guy who was bilingual back there and I, we held up the ketchup. I said, how do you say this? He said, ketchup. Held up the mayonnaise. How do you say this? Mayonnaise. Now, lettuce, lechuga, pickles, pepino. How do you say cheeseburger? How do you say this? And so I could call back from the counter Uno hamburguesa con queso, solo ketchup, mayonesa, lechuga, pepino, por favor. <laughs> and, and I would get the burgers the way I wanted them fixed. And I reduced the number of complaints. And I'd also like to think that I gained some respect because I took the time to learn how to say things in their language. You know what I've learned about people um, and culture is that no matter where you go, no matter what type of culture you're in, People are people, right? I mean, people are people at, at the basic level. Uh, I get to teach on a topic that I get really excited about, and that's the topic of leadership. And the thing about leadership is um, leadership transcends culture. It doesn't matter where you go. John Maxwell teaches, has taught this stuff all over the world. John Maxwell team members like myself are all over the world teaching this stuff, and it works in every culture. It transcends time. I, I really believe that if we're still here, if we're still here a thousand years from now, these principles that I'm gonna talk about are still gonna work. They're still gonna work. Uh, now, some of you, you hear that term leadership and you're, you're maybe already going somewhere in your mind thinking, you know, I'm not a manager, I'm not in management. I don't know that I need to really hear this stuff today. I wanna encourage you, stay with me. Stay with me because this is for you. Because John's definition of leadership is leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. And on average, all of us attempt to influence at least four other people every single day. That's, that's the stats. Um, and if you're in sales, you really are attempting to influence other people, aren't you? Influencing them to do something that you would like them to do, influencing them to think the way that you think about something we all are trying to influence people every single day. So every one of us can benefit from learning how to have more influence with people, right? So stay with me, this is gonna be good stuff. 
So I'm going to be teaching from John's book, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, which has been translated into 47 languages. Yes, you heard that right, 47 languages. It's all over the world. Um, he has sold, he has written over 100 books, and he is the number six seller on Amazon. He's the number one leadership expert in the world, according to several websites and business magazines. And why is he number one? Number one leadership expert. Well, for, for one, it works. His stuff works. And second, even though he is Dr. John Maxwell, he has a way of speaking on everyone's level. He doesn't speak over your head. And that's why I think he has done so well. So let's, let's get into some of these principles. You can take notes. I encourage you to do that, but you don't have to. Uh, but I think I'm going to give you some good things that you can use. So um, I'm going to be touching on three of the laws out of that book. Law number one is the law of the lid. The law of the lid. And what that means is leadership ability is the lid that determines a person's level of effectiveness. I'll say that again. Leadership ability is the lid that determines a person's level of effectiveness. What does that mean? Let's say that you're an average leader. Let's say you're a level five leader on a scale of one to 10. Okay, you're just average. Because you're a five, you're at this level five, your effectiveness will never go above four. Why? Because your leadership caps your effectiveness. Your leadership ability acts as a lid or a cap to your effectiveness. And so the only way to take your effectiveness above a four is to raise your what? Raise your leadership level. Raise your leadership ability, then you, your effectiveness can be raised. That's the law of the lid. So in 1930, two brothers named Dick and Maurice left New Hampshire to California in search of the American dream. In 1937, they succeeded in opening their first drive-in restaurant. And business exploded. They were booming. They were selling pork barbecue sandwiches and hamburgers and hot dogs and fries and shakes. And they're just doing very well. They, they build a larger facility. Um, they are splitting profits in the early 50s of $100,000 a year, which back then was, was a decent amount of money. Put them in their town's financial elite, right? So who were these brothers? Well, back then, you could have found out by driving to their restaurant on the corner of E Street and 14th Street, and on the front of their building was a small neon sign that simply said, McDonald's Hamburgers. The, the McDonald's brothers had hit the American jackpot, and the rest, as they say, is history, right? Mm -hmm. Wrong. Some of you have seen the documentary on Netflix. <laughs> uh, they attempted to franchise their restaurant a couple different times and they couldn't get it to work. They couldn't take it from one restaurant to more than one. But along came a leader named Ray Kroc. And Ray Kroc uh, bought the rights and he franchised, and in four years he had 100 McDonald's. In another four years he had 500 McDonald's. And now there's over 31,000 in hundreds of countries. What was the difference? Their leadership ability. The McDonald's brothers were running smack dab into that law of the lid. They, they didn't have a high enough leadership capability to take it to another level, right? That's the law of the lid. And so I wanna ask you, when your business stops growing and, or plateaus, do you tend <coughs> to look to try different strategies and techniques within the real estate industry, or do you look to take your leadership to the next level? I'm gonna to suggest to you that your effectiveness and your business will um, be more beneficial if you work on taking your leadership to a higher level. Remember, as you take your leadership to a higher level, your effectiveness can go to a higher level. That's the law of the lead. Law number two is the law of influence. The law of influence. Leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. Can you influence people to follow you. That's what we're asking. I want you to think in your minds. Think of a leader, past or present, in your life that you were glad to follow. A leader that you gladly followed in your life. You have that person in your mind? Thinking of them? 
Okay? Now, did you follow them because of their leadership title or position, or did you gladly follow them because of personal qualities they possessed? It was the second one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the personal qualities. It was who they were. You respected who they were as a person. You respected their leadership and their vision, and that's why you followed them, right? Not, not because they held a certain title. That's the law of influence. It's a myth that people uh, try to use their title and think that their title or position is going to be why people follow them. Uh, let's talk about a couple of myths of leadership. Number one is the management myth. The management myth. People think, because I'm a manager, I'm a leader. And you know, for the longest time, back in the 90s, any, uh, any book written on leadership was really written about management. Remember that? I mean, that was the mentality. Leadership is management. Management is leadership. Um, John Maxwell disagrees with that. He says there's a, there's a difference between a manager and a leader. Leaders influence people to follow, whereas managers maintain systems and processes. Did you hear that difference? Okay. So if you want to find out if someone's a manager or a leader, ask them to create positive change in their organization. Because oftentimes, managers can only maintain direction. They often can't change direction. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the management myth. Second is the position myth. The position myth. People think, because I have a certain position, I'm a leader. And I have influence. Um, John quickly found out, John Maxwell found out that uh, in his first job, that just having the title or position of leadership doesn't give you, automatically give you influence in your organization. Just having the title doesn't give you influence. So um, when he entered into his first pastorate, he had the proper college degree for that job. He had been given training by his father in his teenage years. He possessed the title and position of leader in that organization. And yet at the first board meeting, he found out who the real leader of that organization was, a farmer named Claude. When Claude spoke, people listened. When Claude made suggestions, people respected it. And when Claude led, others followed. And John realized that if he was going to have influence in this organization, he would first have to influence Claude, who then in turn would influence everybody else. You catch that? That's the law of influence. So how can we gain influence with people? You know, some people try to use their position and their title to force people to follow them and do what they say. But wouldn't it be better if you could get to a place with people where they respected you so much and they respected what you were about so much that they gladly followed you without having to force them? Wouldn't that be good? One of my favorite movies, leadership movies, is the movie Remember the Titans with Denzel Washington. Have you seen it? I love that movie. I put that movie in about once a year and play it. It inspires me as a leader. It really does. Um, so the setting of that movie is the desegregation time in the civil rights movement. And black schools and white schools were being forced to come together which meant a black football team and a white football team were forced to come together. And Denzel Washington is the coach that is responsible for bringing these two sides together as one. That would be a hard job, wouldn't it? I would not want that job. That's a very difficult thing to do. But he, he attempts different things to try this. So the first thing that, that happens is they're going to football camp and he sees that all the black players get on one bus and all the white players get on another bus <coughs> football camp. And he gets on there and he says, no, 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 no. Everybody off the bus, off the bus. He said, I want one white player, one black player in every seat. You're going to sit next to each other. You're going to get to know each other. They get to football camp. And he says, you're going to bump together. You're going to room together. I want one white player, one black player in each room. And you're going to get to know each other. And I'm going to test you. And I'm going to ask you what you learned about your teammate. Every day at lunch, I'm going to ask you. Seems like a pretty good tactic, you know, does it work? <laughs> not really. Um, there's still a lot of tension, um, not, not going very well. But then he does something that's brilliant. 
He gets them up at 3 in the morning, and he takes them on a jog. They don't know where they're going. And they finally get to this destination after they've been jogging a long time. And he says, gentlemen, we are standing where the Battle of Gettysburg was fought. 50,000 men died right here on this field, fighting the same fight that we are still fighting amongst ourselves today. This green field was painted red with the blood of young boys, hot lead going right through their bodies. Hear their voices speaking to us. I killed my brother with malice in my heart. Hatred destroyed my family. You listening? Take a lesson from the dead. If we don't come together right here on this hallowed ground, then we too will be destroyed just like they were. That's a powerful speech. That's a powerful speech. And you know what? It works. It impacts them. He spoke to their heart. You see the change in tactics. At first he was forcing people. You will get along. You will get to know each other. Then he taps into their emotion. And that is influence. He influences them to go in a new direction. I want to give you a huge key to gaining influence in your life. To gaining influence with others. You ready? It's adding value to others. Adding value to others. John Maxwell says if you only did one thing and you did it every day, you would increase your influence with people and you would raise your leadership lid. And that is every morning you wake up and you ask yourself, who am I going to add value to today? You mentally think through the people you're going to encounter. You look for ways to add value to them and then you do it. That's it. And if you seek to add value to people every single day, you will raise your influence with people. Uh, Zig Ziglar once said that if you will first help people get what they want, they will help you get what you want. Makes sense, doesn't it? It's the giver's game mentality. Isn't it? Those of you familiar with giver's game. If you will first help people get what they want, they'll help you. It's the mentality when they see that you genuinely care about them as a person, they will gladly follow you and help you with what you need. Makes sense, doesn't it? So how do you know if you're an adder or a subtractor? One question. Do I make things better for the people that I lead? That's it. Do I make things better for the people I lead? And if you can't answer that with an unhesitant yes and give evidence that backs it up, you might be a subtractor adding value to others. How can you apply this to your life right now, today, adding value to others? I wanted this to be my priority every day, so I asked my wife if she would make me a sign. It says, who am I going to add value to today? And this hangs in front of my desk, and I see it every day because that's what I want to be about every single day. You could make a sign on your desk. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, but just a reminder Another thing we could do with this is if, if our goal is to make things better for the people around us, um, we could, here's an idea, we can go to those people and ask them, how can I make things better for you? What can I do that would help you in your job every day? Right? And then you would know what they need and you could do those things. And by the way, this isn't just for the leader of this organization. I'm talking to all of you about Gaining influence with the people you work with the most, that you see every day. If you seek to add value to their life every day, you will gain influence with those people, no matter what your position in the company. That's right. All right, so the law of the lid, you're only going to be as effective as your leadership ability. The law of influence, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. How can we gain influence? add value to people every day. And then the third law I want to talk to you about, wrapping it up, is the law of connection. One of my favorite laws, the law of connection. It's all about how to connect better with other people. Do you think learning the skill and art of connecting better with people would help people in sales? Yes or no? Yes. 
think so. And that's why I, I purposely put this section in just for you today. The art of connecting with people. What do I mean when I say connecting with others? I mean developing rapport with people, building credibility, building trust in others. That's very important in sales, isn't it? Because I'm sure you've heard this lots of times. People do business with people they know, like, and trust. Have you heard that before? That's who they do business with, people they know, like, and trust. And so how do we gain that trust? How do we get them to know us better? Um, how do we get them to like us better? Connect with them. The art of connecting. So I'm going to give you three things today of how to connect better with people. First of all, know your audience. Know the people you're talking to. And by the way, these principles work whether you're talking to an audience, a big audience of people, or a one-on-one. -on -one. It works the same either way. Um, know your people. Learn their names. Learn their background. What are they passionate about? What do they care about in life? Get to know them. By the way, do you know what people's favorite word in the English language is? It's their own name. Very good. What's your name? Diane, she nailed it. It's their own name. People love to hear their name, don't they? And so if you can learn their name, write it down, remember their name when you see them, and then use their name. It's powerful. You're like, wow, that person actually cared enough about me to remember my name. Um, and so go to where they are. Um, know your audience. A, Linda, uh, a lady named Linda Kaplan Taylor one of the marketing geniuses of the world, her company helped put Aflac on the map. They came to her company and they said, look, nobody knows who we are. We need your help. And so she took it back to her team. She said, let's brainstorm. And one of the people said, what if we, what if we said in a duck's voice, Aflac? <laughs> and that idea stuck. And do you know they are now the most number five recognized company in the world? It's all because of a stupid duck. <laughs> Um, but Linda Kaplan Taylor got an appointment with Warren Buffett. You know who Warren Buffett is? The billionaire tycoon? She was told she got 10 minutes with Warren Buffett. That's all anybody gets is 10 minutes. She did some research on Warren Buffett. And through her research, found out that his favorite beverage is Cherry Coke. And so she brought a Cherry Coke to their meeting. And she said, Mr. Buffett, I know that I only have 10 minutes here with you but I thought we'd start off with your favorite beverage. She slid that across to him. He popped the top on that and he said, young lady, nobody ever started with my favorite beverage. You can have all the time you want. What was that? Knowing your audience, knowing your audience. Number two, go to where they are. Go to where they are. When you're trying to communicate and connect with people, you don't want any barriers between you. You don't want physical barriers between you. I learned this. This was good information for me to learn. I used to sit down from people across from my desk. Um, you know, I'm behind my big bulky desk um, with things on it and they're across from me. That's a physical barrier that you're putting between you and them. And it's a psychological barrier. Um, you want the feeling of connection. And so it would be better to put two chairs across from each other and sit across from one another and talk to them that way. Or another technique is to actually sit <coughs> beside them at a table and it sends the message, I wanna work beside you, I wanna work with you. So you don't want any physical barriers, you don't want any communication barriers, which means if they're from a different background, a different culture than you, you've gotta learn about their culture. You've got to learn about their language and what they like and what their dislikes are so that you can connect better with them. Back in the days of cloth diapers, um, there was a couple that was out and they had a baby um, that started crying. The diaper needed changed. And the wife was just really exhausted. And she said, honey, can you, can you change the diaper this time? And he tried to play dumb. He said, well, I, I don't know how. I don't know how to change a diaper. Well, she knew that he was a big baseball fan. And so she said, look, Buster, you lay the diaper out like a diamond. You, you put home plate and second plate together and put the baby's bottom on the pitcher's mound. You connect third base and first base together and slide home underneath. 